right, so let's talk about interviewing. <clears throat> Who's in the interviewing process right now? Who's looking for jobs? Michael, Stewart, Harvest. Okay, so about, well, let's say about two thirds of you. Good. Have, has, I think I've reviewed most of your resumes at this point. If you still haven't gotten your resume reviewed or maybe you made changes the first time around, want me to take a look at it, send it to me. Um, there's also a woman in our New York office who does resume reviews as well, so two sets of eyes, better than one. Um, hopefully between us we can, we can help you in, uh, in that process. All right. So we're going, to talk about, um, we're going to talk about interviewing today for investment banking. Um, some interviewing for private equity is, is kind of similar, um, and we'll talk about the similarities as we go through. But we'll talk about, we'll give a review, a review on the overview of investment banking, hierarchy within investment banks, um, very much a review. So we'll go through that quickly. We'll discuss who the ideal candidates are for analyst and associate jobs. Those candidates or those characteristics are a little bit different based on the differing responsibilities. So we'll distinguish, distinguish between those. We're going to talk about some resume tips. We'll also review a... Um, We'll review a sample resume, talk about what, what I like about it, what I don't like about it, give you some ideas on what to do with your resumes. Um, and then we're going to get into talking about some of the questions you might face in an interview, whether they're qualitative questions, whether they're more technical or quantitative questions. Banking interviews are really known for being technical in terms of the questions that get asked. That is, things like, how do you calculate enterprise value? All right. Tell me how to calculate certain valuation multiples, those types of things. Testing your technical finance, valuation, accounting knowledge, maybe asking you questions about models you've built, modeling skills. All right. So we're going to go through all of those. It sort of serves as a uh, pseudo review of course concepts. So we'll do that. And then um, we'll talk a little bit about prepping for interviews, tips. A lot of those things are, um, I think, pretty pretty much common knowledge for most of you, but we'll go through them um, nonetheless. All right, so real quickly, like I said, we're going to do a quick overview of investment banking. Um, when we talk about the industry, the, you know, if we talk about you know, the Wall Street, the bulge bracket firms, again, we're talking about firms that offer a full range of banking products and services, everything from Lev Finance, LevFin, um, to maybe financial sponsors groups, advisory, M&A, restructuring. Certain banks might have industry groups focused on particular industries. Capital markets groups are those that are going to go out and help companies raise, raise debt, raise equity, raise mezzanine capital, either in the public or the private markets. Uh, but again, when we say uh, bulge bracket banks, we're talking about those that are full service. We're talking about the Goldmans of the world, Morgan Stanleys of the world what used to be Lehman, what used to be Bear Stearns, what used to be Merrill Lynch, et cetera. All right. Landscapes change, but the term bulge bracket, I think, still applies. A lot of those banks are, you know, th that uh, are still going to be in a, uh, operating in that format. Any questions on the bulge brackets? Bulge brackets are starting to hire again. All right. So if you're looking for jobs, there is a little bit of a good news out there. We are seeing a little hiring. At the, uh, at the bulge bracket firms. We're starting to see a little pickup in M&A activity. Several big deals announced recently um, over the last four to six weeks. So it's, I think the, um, for the first time in probably the last year, I can say that industry conditions are starting to improve. Uh, whether it holds, whether it's going to continue on an uptick for the foreseeable f future, who knows. But for now, it looks a little better, at least than it did six months ago. Right, but Bulge brackets right now, by and large, I still think are a tough place to get a job. All right? They're not hiring in the numbers that they once were, and there are a lot of ex-bankers that are out on the street still competing to get back into those jobs. So um, if you're looking at the bulge brackets, I would say also try and focus um, some of your time, some of your effort on boutiques just to, I think, maximize your, your chances for success. Uh, I think if you're looking for jobs, boutiques are probably the best, pl best way to go right now. The boutiques did not get into the trouble that the Goldmans and the Morgans and all these different groups got into last year. They didn't have to take TARP funds. Most boutiques are more focused, by and large, on advisory services, maybe doing opinions work, as opposed to having a sales and trading, a proprietary <laughs> trading group, prop trading, having a research arm. 
things like that. All right, so boutiques in many cases you might refer to as kind of pure play investment banks as compared to the, uh, the bulge brackets. Some boutiques might be M&A focused, some might be restructuring focused. Um, if you talk about the restructuring, the banks that have the reputation as being restructuring focused banks, Houlihan Loki, Miller Buckfire, probably two of the best places to be looking right now. Um, great reputations, they're in a great sector, restructuring, and they're hiring. Right? I've seen job postings for both of those banks and several other boutiques. So if you just look around a little bit, you'll see them as well. Um, you know, some newer banks, there's Evercore, Green Hill, Centerview. You know, a lot of these boutique banks have been formed by ex-Wall Street guys. Again, really to be a more of a pure play advisory restructuring type of shop. Um, and they're doing very, very well right now. It's a good time for boutique banks. Um, the tough part about recruiting in, in, in the boutique environment is you got to do more research. They're not as prominent as the Goldman Sachs of the world. You don't hear about them on CNBC every day. You don't read about them in the Wall Street Journal. You're going to have to do a little more research to find them and figure out if they're hiring. Um, IBI does have, and I think I mentioned this in the first class, it bears repeating though, IBI has a basically a database of financial services firms across the country. It can be parsed by geography. The Texas list has like 300 different firms, many of which are, are boutique investment banks. So if you're looking for a job, if you're looking at boutique banks, get the list and start making calls. Start hitting websites, start trying to find them. Um, you might even do Google searches on the internet. Investment Banking Dallas, Investment Banking Houston, mm -hmm. Investment Banking Austin. You do enough searches and sooner or later these things will pop up on your radar screen. You just have to do more research to find them. The boutique bank I worked for, I didn't even know existed until I met a guy who happened to be, who happened to be working there and find out that, you know, oh yeah, by the way, we're hiring right now. So it takes a little more time, a little more effort to come across them. Um, and middle market banks, you know, here we're really talking about banks that focus on smaller deals. Typically, middle market's defined as 500 million and below. You'll also hear the term lower middle market usually referring to transactions 50 million and below. Right? Generally speaking, um, you know, Houlihan, a lot of those banks we talked about before, they also play in the middle market, but they're picking up a lot of business right now. And I think Houlihan, Miller Buckfire, are focusing on a lot of larger deals these days than they used to. Um, and there are a lot of small, lower middle market, middle market banks around Houston, around Dallas. You, again, you just gotta find them. Just got to do some research. Hierarchy at investment banks, again, top of the food chain is managing directors. Um, these are really rainmakers for the, for, the, uh, for the investment bank, mostly focused on bringing in clients. When a pitch occurs, the MD is usually giving the pitch. If you're an analyst and associate or associate, you've been working on pitches, sometimes you'll get invited to go along and see the MD in action, which can be kind of cool. Um, Usually it comes down to how many people are going to be there on the client side versus you know, how many people are on the, on the bank's deal team. It's only going to be two people on the client side. Bank's probably not going to drag 10 people to that meeting. Um, but a lot of times as an analyst and associate, you will get to go and it's kind of a nice reward for all the hard work. Uh, some banks have the director title, some don't. Similar to an MD, maybe it's an MD in training. Um, but still focused a little more on execution. Um, somebody probably just came out of a VP role. All right, and again, we talked about the VPs really doing a lot of the day-to-day, -day, managing the execution of transactions, being the day-to-day -day point of contact with the client for execution-related matters once a company has hired the investment bank. And then when we talk about junior bankers, we're talking about analysts, we're talking about associates. These are the folks especially at the analyst level, doing valuations, running financial models, putting together a lot of the, the Excel analyses, putting together pitch books, doing research on particular transactions. When they get on a live deal, doing a lot of the administrative tasks like coordinating conference calls, arranging for materials to be delivered. If you get to go on pitches, you're probably the one who's actually carrying the physical pitch books. A lot of fun, but we all gotta start somewhere. Um, and then associates usually uh, overseeing analysts, checking their work, 
guiding their work, mentoring them, making sure that the analysts are learning the ins and outs of modeling, um, learning the ins and outs of valuation, et cetera. All right. Any questions? This should not be new for anybody. But if you have questions, just let me know. All right, so let's talk about what makes ideal analysts, ideal associates. We'll talk a little bit about the recruiting season at, uh, at schools. We'll talk about the recruiting season for lateral hires, et cetera. Um, analysts, as I believe I've mentioned before, typically coming out of undergraduate program programs. Most analyst programs at investment banks are typically two years. The really good analysts sometimes get asked to stay on for a third. Sometimes the really good analysts get promoted to associate directly. But by and large, it's a two-year program after which analysts might you know, maybe jump to private equity, uh, maybe go back and get an MBA, maybe decide I've had enough, I want to go work for a nonprofit. Um, you know, after two years of, of banking, that's you know, could happen. Pretty grueling lifestyle, as we've talked about. But what makes a good analyst, um, think of the lifestyle and think of, of how hard um, the banker is expected to work, the expectations that are placed on the banker. If you're working 80 to 100 hours, you better have a good attitude. You better have a lot of endurance. You better be very committed to what you're doing. Right? When you're going in and interviewing for banking jobs, you should demonstrate that you understand the commitment level you're going to have to make um, and, and probably not talk about all the fun things you like to do on the weekends because you're not going to have weekends when you work in investment banking. You will work seven days a week, especially if you work at a bulge bracket firm. Right. Um, and a key one, I think, is attention to detail. This is something I was not at all good with when I came out of college, just you know, checking work product, making sure formatting is correct, making sure everything is, is the way investment bankers need to see it. Um, that's something that I think a lot of people need to learn. If you're good at that and if you can demonstrate you're good at that, I think that gives you a, a nice leg up um, because otherwise it's up to an associate to, to hold your hand and walk you through and teach, teach those types of things. And another important thing that I'll note here is that you don't necessarily need a finance or accounting background. Right? I went to business school with a guy who was an English major, undergrad, came out of undergrad, went into investment banking and just did, spent the extra time learning what he needed to learn, learning how to build models, and he's a really sharp guy on top of it too, but did just fine. So you don't necessarily need the finance or accounting degree. I think in this class we've covered a lot of the concepts you need to understand um, from a finance or accounting perspective. And if you've read some of the pre-work, the basics on corporate finance, the basic accounting um, methodologies, then you, you probably will be just fine. Um, responsibilities, again, should be no surprise like we've talked about. You're going to spend a lot of time marketing, putting together pitch books, putting together presentations. You're going to run a lot of valuation models. You're going to put together a lot of Excel models, LBO models, financial models, uh, M&A models like we did yesterday. And then on a live deal, you're going to be doing administrative tasks. It's just how it ends up working out. Let's talk a little bit about the associate. Um, again, like I said before, associates for the most part, at least at the bulge bracket firms, folks who are coming out of business school with their MBA, maybe they had a banking background prior to that, maybe they were an analyst at one point, went back, got the MBA, they're coming out, now they're an associate. Maybe they were in a completely different industry, got their MBA, and decided to go into banking. Really doesn't matter. Typically this is someone with a, with a business, uh, with a graduate business degree, but sometimes, like we said, really good analysts might get promoted to the associate level as well. All right. And a lot of the good traits for an analyst uh, or traits of a good analyst make traits of a good associate. But again, associates have a little different job responsibilities than analysts. They're largely overseeing analyst work. They're mentoring analysts. They're teaching. So you know, obviously need to be good managers, need to be good teachers need to have those strong understandings of the finance, strong understanding of the finance, the accounting concepts, understanding of um, valuation, because if they're teaching someone, they obviously need to understand it themselves. Um, really importantly, I think, for, for an associate, having good client interaction skills, especially if that person aspires to, to go a little further in banking, become a VP one day, and deal with clients on a day-to-day -day basis. 
when associates get hired out of business school, the bank is usually looking at them as someone who can become a VP and maybe ultimately one day an MD. All right, so that's, I think, a really important skill or trait of a, of a good associate. Um, and then attention to detail, I think, just as a, for the reasons I said earlier, um, these pitch books, when they're put together, they're pretty sharp. They're pretty, pretty, well, uh, pretty well organized. They need to present the bank in the best possible light. Um, work responsibilities, we've talked about explaining, overseeing assignments to analysts, working on pitch books, presentations, and um, a lot of times doing some of the more complex financial modeling. Right? If you've got a really complicated financial model, the associate might take the first crack at it. They might work a little more closely with the analyst in building that model if it's a little more complex than normal. Compensation. Um, there's New York and then there's not New York. All right. Um, there's bulge bracket and there's not bulge bracket. I think if you're talking about a bulge bracket firm, um, a lot of times, you know, an analyst working at a bulge bracket firm, a base salary probably fifty, sixty thousand. Um, I think is pretty, pretty much typical there. And in a good year, a bonus maybe you know one or two times that. All right. So they can be making you know into six figures first couple years out. Probably needs to be a good year for whatever that that product is that they're, they're working on, whether it's M&A or capital markets or what have you. Um, the associate side, typically if you're coming out of graduate business school, uh, probably a base of around 120, 125,000 would be pretty typical. And again, in a good year, the opportunity for bonus of you know, a couple, three times that maybe. And I know a lot of, uh, a lot of folks have made you know, three, four hundred thousand dollars first year out of business school. At, uh, at Goldman or Morgan or one of those, those places. Um, when you talk about VPs, probably someone who's making 200, 250 base in New York and then you know, can make a couple times bonus that. Um, when you look at, if you read in the Wall Street Journal, you read that you know, average compensation for a Goldman employee was maybe seven or 800,000 last year. You get a sense for the magnitude. The MDs are up in the stratosphere. Everybody else is kind of at the sub 500 level or maybe around 500 for VPs, 600 or so. So people make very, very good money in banking in New York. Um, if you're talking about banking anywhere else, maybe you're working at a boutique in Houston or a boutique in Dallas, the numbers can change radically. Um, really depends on the firm, depends on the types of, uh, the types of fees they bring in every year um, and how that will affect their ability to pay good size bonuses. Um, you know, I would say for if you're working in Dallas, I think it's a pretty average cost of living city. Um, maybe an analyst salary of 30, 40 grand out of school, um, but probably not getting the, uh, the upside and the bonus that you would if you worked at a bulge bracket firm. So maybe 30 to 40 grand and maybe 20, 30, 40, 50% bonus in a good year. So the numbers go down dramatically when you get outside of New York. Um, cost of living, obviously, and the fact that you're probably working at a firm that does smaller deals, too. So does that make sense? Does that help clarify? If you're in school right now, I know you're, you're getting your MBA right now. Career offices will have compensation surveys that you can look at. Um, you can probably, as an alum to any school, probably go back into the career website, and they'll probably have comp surveys across industries, across geographies you can look at as well to give you a better idea. I think those are some general guidelines though. Okay, now um, folks can also get hired laterally. All right, so an analyst who's worked at another bulge bracket firm or maybe worked in a different industry. I actually worked in commercial banking first, um, got credit trained, got some modeling skills under my belt, and then uh, moved into investment banking and got some some corporate finance valuation experience as well. So there are opportunities to do that. I know several of you are not in school right now. You're actually out working. So there are opportunities to get hired as a lateral hire. Really, it's a matter of demonstrating you've got the skills to be successful in banking. And that's where I think the IBI course is, in, is important. You can go, especially to a boutique bank that maybe doesn't have a training program, can't afford to have a year-round training program like the bulge brackets have. You can go in day one and say, I've done valuation models, I've built financial models, I've built LBO models, I've built M&A models. Here are examples of the models I've built. 
All right, here's my, you know, you can ask me technical questions and I can, I can answer those. Um, I think that's really probably the most important thing. Demonstrate you can be productive day one, um, especially when it comes to a boutique bank or even a private equity firm. Private equity firms, by definition, usually keeps themselves very, very small. They don't maintain extensive training programs. They might send students to an IBI and get them trained, but for the most part, they want people who have transaction and, and financial modeling experience and can come in day one and make a difference. So that's really where I think you demonstrate or differentiate yourself if you're a lateral, if you're a lateral candidate. So let's talk a little bit about the recruiting season. If we're talking about new analyst or associate hires, again, these are non-lateral hires. Um, we're talking about analysts or associates being hired directly out of school. Actually, we're right now at the start of recruiting season for most schools. Right? Most, if you're in school right now, banks are probably coming on campus, giving information sessions, starting to maybe sign people up for interview schedules for this month, next month, etc. So if you're in school, you're looking for jobs, get into the process now if you haven't done so already. Um, a lot of banks, especially the bulge bracket banks, they might only target a limited number of schools, usually the bigger schools, sometimes the Ivy League schools. Um, most banks, the bulge brackets are headquartered in New York. The Ivy League schools are kind of in the Northeast, kind of makes sense in that regard. Um, but if you're not on, if your school's not on the target list, uh, you can still get on their radar screen. You can still get involved in the process. I had a student about a year ago, yeah, it was about a year ago because the recruiting process was just getting started. He had gone to, I think, University of Arkansas, was, had graduated a few years before that, was living up in Arkansas, and decided that he wanted to go and see if he could talk to Goldman Sachs. Goldman wasn't coming to his school. Goldman was only coming to UT down in Austin. So he called, managed to talk his way in. They let him come down. He drove down from Arkansas, was able to go to the UT information session and be part of that process. Um, and I don't, I, think, I don't think he got a job, unfortunately. It was right after Lehman and all that. But um, you can still find a way to get in the door. All right? And that kind of leads me to, the, to these next points. If you're not on the target list, obviously that's one thing you might do. Find out where the bulge bracket banks are coming. Try and find a way to get into the in information sessions. Network with some of the, um, the on-campus recruiting folks from those banks and get yourself into the process. Um, but I cannot underemphasize, or I cannot overemphasize, rather, the importance of networking. All right? Call everyone you know, especially take advantage of your school's alumni list. Go into your school's alumni directory. Most are online nowadays. You can go on, you can search by geography, you can search by profession or industry. If you're interested in banking in Dallas, all right, search on banking in Dallas. Find everyone and anyone and everyone from your school who's an alum, who works in investment banking, who works in Dallas, start reaching out to them, try and get on their calendar for an informational interview, which is basically an informal, you sit down for coffee, ask them a little bit about the job. They're obviously going to ask you a little bit about yourself. The theory being if you can impress them in the informational interview, they're going to help get you into more of a formal interview setting. All right? Anytime you talk to anyone in an investment bank, consider it an interview, a, a formal interview, in, informational interviews would be, uh, would be the same. All right, so again, I can't overemphasize the importance of this. Find as many people as you can. And most people, I've found, will be very receptive to this. And right, I've hit my alumni database many times. I've approached many people that I didn't know, just approach them blindly via phone or via internet. They'll usually take your call. They'll usually agree to sit down for coffee um, or spend 10 or 15 minutes with you. Um, so just, you'd, you'd be surprised at how far that can take you. All right. So definitely try that first. Um, contact the banks, contact the recruiting departments directly. Um, figure out what's going on in the process, what are the key dates, who are the key people at the investment banks to start talking to, who's running the process, and find a way to get your resume in front of that person. Don't just think that you can go to the Goldman website, submit your resume electronically, chances are it will never be seen by human eyes. Right? Those typically get fed into a system, they get scanned, they look for keywords in certain resumes, and unless your resume has those keywords on it, it'll never see the light of day. 
All right, so don't just do that and stop there. You've got to get a live person on the phone, get contact information, get in front of them. It's probably the toughest recruiting environment we've ever seen in our lives. So you've got to make sure you take several steps to make sure you're successful in the process. All right, networking, contact the recruiting departments directly. Even if you can find people's names or contact info by hitting their website, Sometimes the boutique investment banks will have bios on their website. Find an analyst, maybe find someone who's, who's, who's uh, in the same town as you are, or maybe they had the same school as you did. Maybe you've got something in common with them. I don't know what it would be. Start reaching out to them. Also trying to get informational interviews. Try and get, you know, try and get into the process somehow. All right? It's very important to get um, to get started early, very important to uh, do as much networking as you can, especially now. All right, so again, timing. Um, if you're looking for full-time analyst, full-time associate positions, if you're in school right now, like I said, they're on campus probably right now. They're going to be interviewing in the fall. Sometimes they'll make job offers before the, the holiday break. Sometimes they'll do a second round set of interviews in January or so and then make their offers then. Um, if you're looking for internships, uh, usually that, that type of thing will start ramping up after the holiday break. Usually in the start of the calendar year, you'll start seeing banks um, and other firms, for that matter, start focusing on filling internship needs. Not sure what internship hiring is going to look like for next year at this point, but um, if that's what you're looking for, definitely um, make, sure you, make sure you start now to understand what the key dates are. Don't wait until it's too late. Um, first year MBAs will oftentimes do an internship at an investment bank. If they do well in their internships, a lot of times they'll walk out with the job offer for the next year. Okay, and the same thing might hold true if you're a junior and undergrad. Get an internship between junior and senior year. Hopefully you can walk out with a job, in, with a job offer in hand, not have to or be able to circumvent the, the recruiting process that next year. Again, this is for folks in school, not necessarily lateral hires. Um, lateral hires can occur all year long, especially when you talk about boutique investment banks. The boutique banks have um, usually are a lot smaller in terms of their overall size. They have a lot lower recruiting requirements. A lot of times they will not interview at schools at all. Okay? They may just they may need one person a year, and whenever that need comes up, They'll either start reaching out to people that they know. Maybe they'll post a job. Maybe they won't. All right, so this is where it makes sense to network with as many people as you can. Stay on their radar screen. Try and keep yourself apprised of when they're hiring. The goal is to be there when they're ready to make a hire and have them think of you. All right, so that's really important. Um, and again, I, like I said, I just can't even overemphasize it. Just network as much as you can. Sometimes banks might use headhunters. Personally, I've never had great experience with, with recruiters or headhunters, but a lot of people, some people have. Yeah. And if, it, if it's worked for you, if, it, you know, if it's something you feel comfortable with, then might be another way to approach it. But um, I would personally recommend take it into your own hands, make as many contacts as you can, and just keep following up and following up. Eventually, you'll be successful. It's all about numbers these days. You've got to throw as much as you can against the wall and hope something sticks. It's just the way it is. All right, so let's talk about resumes. Obviously, a, uh, a key piece of literature that you need to market yourself. And it's important, obviously, that that's structured, formatted well, um, really presents you in the best possible light, showcasing previous work experience, your education, your outside activities. Um, common mistakes that people make. Um, Probably the most common mistakes are formatting. Um, and the biggest pet peeve I see when I see resumes are resumes that are not focused on what someone has accomplished. If you're talking only about, say, what you've been responsible for, you know, my, my strong feeling is that you really need to show a resume that um, shows a lot of results, the results that you've, that you've uh, achieved over your career. I think that's, by and large, what recruiters are looking for right now. It's not just what you're responsible for, but what you've achieved. So that's usually my biggest comment to anyone who sends me their resume, is to be accomplishments foca focused. Um, sometimes formatting, keep the formatting simple, keep it easy to read, 
Don't use a lot of different font sizes. Don't use a lot of different fonts. Don't use a lot of shading or coloring or any. Keep it very simple. You don't want someone to get a headache when they look at your resume. You don't want them to have to search around to find key pieces of information. All right, keep it formatted simply, consistently, um, and just make it easy to read. Um, if you're recently out of school or if you're in school now, I like to see resumes that are limited to a page. Um, if you've been out for several years then, and had several jobs, then obviously this is going to be very difficult to do. So um, use your judgment there. But again, if you're, if you're on the younger side or if you're in school right now, keep it to a page. All right. Obviously, I, I think it goes without saying no typo, typos or grammatical mistakes, but you'd be surprised. I've seen some resumes that have some crazy things on them. Um, so double check, triple check your resume. Real importantly, make sure you're familiar with every single point on your resume and you're prepared to talk about it. Okay, if you're saying that you're fluent in Brazilian Portuguese, don't be surprised if some hotshot banker decides to connect, just decides to conduct the interview in Brazilian Portuguese. I've seen it happen. All right. If you say that you're, you're an avid reader, be prepared to talk about some, some, uh, some books that you've recently read. All right. So just keep in mind, everything on your resume is absolutely fair game. You don't want to get caught um, either not being able to um, demonstrate that you know something you say you know or demonstrate that you can have an intelligent conversation on a subject. Um, don't embellish your roles on previous tra financial transactions, kind of along the same lines. Um, you don't want to lie on your resume, obviously. It's a marketing piece, so everyone, I think, puffs up their resume a little bit. But don't, uh, don't over-embellish. Don't lie, certainly. People lose their jobs for, for falsifying resumes, so just be careful with that. Uh, let's take a look real quickly at a resume example. You should have this in your... Um, in your file, in your uh, subfolder for interviewing. This is, um, this is just, I think, an, a made-up person that we use at, uh, at IBI um, with some, I think, some, some made-up companies as well. But um, I think this is a very typical resume in terms of formatting for investment banking. Hopefully everybody can see that. And this person is obviously someone who's been out of school for a while. They're starting with experience. If you're still in school, if you haven't had a job or an internship or something like that, you probably want to start with your education. Okay? But if you've been out for a while, probably start with experience. Um, talk about that first and leave education to, uh, to come a little bit later. All right, so this person um, worked for ABC Company in Chicago. Um, I like to see dates on the far right margin. They were an analyst in investment banking, focused on M&A or sell-side M&A in tech. All right, and my, really my biggest peeve with this resume is the fact that it's talking more about responsibilities than accomplishments. All right, so I would, if I were reviewing this resume for a student or for someone, I would recommend talk about what you accomplished, not just what you were responsible for. All right, your, the analysis you did was instrumental in getting the deal closed because of this. Or you highlighted a key issue that you know, allowed you know, for a higher bank. Or why do you want to work at this particular bank? Now here they really want to know that you understand what Goldman is all about. Or you know, even this boutique bank in Dallas or Houston or Chicago or wherever it might be, you, know, you understand what the bank's about, its culture, its market, the industry it's focused on. So obviously you will want to have done your research going in. If you're talking to a boutique bank versus a bulge bracket bank, you're probably going to phrase your answers a little bit differently. Right? Boutique banks tend to um, not be so rigid in terms of the hierarchy within the bank among its staff. So as a junior person, you'll probably get a little more client time than you would at working at Goldman Sachs. When I worked at a boutique bank, I got to go to clients a lot on my own, go out and spend the day with the client. And you don't always get that at the bulge bracket banks. At the boutique bank I was at, I got to take the lead on execution roles a lot more than I would have had I been at a bulge bracket bank. So it just, you know, I think the opportunity to step up, the opportunity to get more responsibility, the opportunity at a boutique bank to get more exposure to the senior bankers on a day-to-day -day basis was really valuable for me. I got to work directly with our, we had partners, it was a partnership 
but the equivalent of a managing director. I got to go into their office, sit down with them one-on-one -on -one all the time. It was a nice experience. If it's a full service bank, <clears throat> you know, obviously you're going to want to tail tailor your answer accordingly. You're going to be working with bigger clients, all right? Or that bank may have a particular focus, um, particular reputation in, say, pharmaceuticals or M&A. Maybe it's, you know, a leading uh, capital markets player. Right? So you're just going to want to understand what that bank is about and tailor your answer accordingly. All right? Any questions on that? You'll get these all the time. I mean, that tell me about yourself. Why do you want to be a banker? Why do you want to work at this bank? I think you'll get those in pretty much any interview you go into in investment banking. Where do you see yourself in five years? Um, I, I think here it really depends on what position you're interviewing for. Right? If you're interviewing for an analyst position, I think it's okay to say, I want for the next two years to be committed here. This is, I know it's a two-year program. I, may, I plan to be a top performing analyst, maybe get promoted to associate. That'd be great. But after two years, I'm going to take, take a look back. I'm going to assess what I've learned in this role. Maybe I'll go back to business school. Right. Maybe I'll want to stay on as an associate. Maybe I'll go to private equity, move over to the buy side. All right. So it really kind of depends. If you're an associate, you're definitely going to want to show that you're thinking long term with regard to your, your future at the bank. All right. You're not using this as a stepping stone to jump to private equity after three years. Right. Again, if you're interviewing for an associate, they're looking at you as though you could be a potential VP, potential MD one day. Right. Your answer should be consistent with that. I plan to move up. My goal is to make VP within three years and then make v MD within another four or five years. Right. That type of thing. All right. So be prepared to answer that. I don't know if I'd say I want to be an investment banker for life. But, but clearly, you'll want to have given some thought to your future. And if you're an associate candidate, that future had better involve the investment bank for at least the next several years. Right. What's your favorite class in school? Um, here, it really doesn't I don't think it really matters what your answer is. Again, I don't think you necessarily need to be a quant person to be successful in banking. All right. The quant side of banking we've taught you here, it's not rocket science. All right. maybe, it was, maybe you loved English. Great. Talk about it. Maybe you love math. Fantastic. Talk about it. If you're interviewing for more of a quant role, maybe sales and trading, fixed income is a very quant position. If you're interviewing at a hedge fund that's a quant hedge fund, then you know, you're, probably, you're probably going to be a math person to begin with. Um, but I think in banking, just you know, talk about whatever your favorite subject was and why. Right? Probably shouldn't be gym class. All right. Probably should be something a little beyond that. Shouldn't be study hall. Right, um, but I think that's a pretty straightforward question. Any thoughts on that or questions? All right, I'm sure you can think of a lot more qualitative questions. I'm sure you've been asked a lot more qualitative questions as well. I think those are probably some of the more common ones you'll see, though. So I would say at the very least, just be prepared on those. But really, be um, for a banking interview, be more prepared to talk about some of the technical issues here. And again, like I said earlier, at this point, we're going to talk more on the technical issues we've, we've discussed in class. This will be kind of a, a course review of sorts. Um, and as, as you're preparing for interviews, this can also be a really good reference um, back to some of these, these course concepts. There is also um, a, a handout that I put on the table back there for common interview questions that goes well beyond just those that we have here in the slideshow. So take a look at these. Use these as a reference, but also go through that handout because there are dozens of questions in there that you can use as a guideline to help you prep for interviews as well. All right, but common questions, technical questions you'll get in banking interviews or maybe even private equity interviews. Um, what is total enterprise value? Obviously, it's one of the key concepts of the course. We've been talking about it since class two. All right, so it's very important. You're going to need to be able to define it the value of the total company, the value provided by all providers of capital, debt, equity, preferred, et cetera. You, know, be able to, you should be able to tell, tell someone what the formula is and why each individual item is included in that formula. So market value of equity plus debt plus preferred plus minority interest minus cash. All right, market value of equity needs to be on a fully diluted basis. 
I think we'll talk about that a little more later, but you should be able to, you should um, be able to note that. What's the difference between enterprise value and equity value? Again, enterprise value is the value of the, the total firm. Equity value is specific to only one provider of capital. Right. For a heavily leveraged firm, equity value could be a very small percentage of total value, total enterprise value. And so that's why we look at TEV. It combines all forms of capital. What is minority interest? Um, if you own more than, it should be 50%, not 80%. If you own more than 50%, or if a company owns more than 50% of another entity, it's required to consolidate the books. Minority interest is the portion of that firm or that entity that the company does not own. If you think of it as a liability, I think that's probably the best, best way to remember that. How do we calculate MVE or equity value? Stock price times shares outstanding, but remember shares outstanding needs to be on a fully diluted basis. Fully diluted means we take our basic shares and then we incorporate the effect of dilutive securities. Dilutive securities like options, warrants, convertible preferred, convertible debt, all of those things need to be taken into account. That dilution needs to be added to our basic share count. All right, basic shares always from the cover of the most recent 10K or Q, right, whichever is more recent. Okay, should you use basic or fully diluted? We just said we should use fully diluted. The reason being, if we only use basic, we're going to undercut the valuation of the company. Right? Market value of equity will be too low, and when we add that into our total enterprise value, TEV will be too low as well. So always use fully diluted shares. And full, the dilution is always calculated using the treasury stock method. Right? Remember, treasury stock method is where the... Um, where we assume that proceeds from, from, the op uh, from the exercise of employee options, those proceeds are used by the company to go out in the market, buy as many shares as they can at the prevailing market price, and then only issue the difference as net new shares. All right. Any questions on these? This should all be review. If something doesn't look, good, look right to you or if you have a question, definitely let me know. Now is the time. Um, you also get some accounting questions from time to time, right? Please name a few items from the <clears throat> current assets, current liability sections of the balance sheet. Again, this is meant to test your knowledge of accounting, meant to test your knowledge of how a financial statement is set up. All right, so on the balance sheet, current assets, cash, AR, inventory, etc. On the liability side, current liabilities would be things like AP, accrued liabilities, current portion of long-term debt, et cetera. Um, Longer-term assets would be gross PP&E, right, the fixed assets of the company, buildings, machinery, equipment, vehicles, land, furniture, computers, et cetera. Um, and then other long-term assets would be intangibles, goodwill, et cetera. The liabilities and equity side, longer-term liabilities are probably going to be long-term debt, capital leases, maybe some pension obligations. <clears throat> and then the equity section will be things like common stock, additional paid in capital, retained earnings, treasury stock, et cetera. All right, should be pretty much review. Remember, balance sheet must balance, obviously. Um, How is the cash flow statement structured? Remember, there are three sections of the cash flow statement, cash from operations, cash from investing, cash from financing. Cash from operations takes net income. <clears throat> to that, we add any non-cash charges like DNA, sometimes uh, non-cash gains or losses, et cetera, changes in working capital accounts. Investing section usually will be things like CapEx, asset dispositions, purchase or sale of long-term securities, acquisitions to the extent the company's done them. The financing section will measure changes in our capital um, in our equity accounts, in our debt accounts, borrowings, repayments, issuance of new equity, repurchase of treasury shares, dividend payments, etc. Right. So be prepared to walk people through those financial statements. Be prepared to walk someone through an income statement as well. Remember when we put up the income statement down to EBIT, everything EBIT and above was operating related? Be prepared to make that distinction, operations versus financing down here. 
Questions on this? Another accounting question, how is depreciation integrated within the three financial statements? Remember, depreciation gets expensed in the income statement. All right, so it's a non-cash expense in the income statement. Because it's non-cash, we add it back to net income in the cash flow statement, cash from operations section. And then depreciation is, always, is also found in the cumulative depreciation section of the balance sheet. All right, so you'll see it work its way through all three financial statements. All right, questions on that? Everybody follow that? A lot of people have been getting these. I've had several students get this very question, all right, as well as a few others that I'll point out later on. <clears throat> what are the typical valuation multiples? We've gone through these. We've got our enterprise value multiples, enterprise value to revenues, EBITDA, EBIT. Remember, it needs to be operating to operating, unlevered to unlevered. Enterprise value is unlevered. It does not consider specific capital contributions, does not consider leverage. We're blind to how the company is financed. And then those denominator items are all EBIT and above in the income statement. They're all operating related. And then price earnings is an equity multiple. It is after we've taken into account the amount of debt the company uses. All right, market value of equity is specific to the equity holders. After we've considered debt, earnings is earnings available to the common shareholders after interest expense has been paid. All right, so you've got unlevered multiples here, and price earnings is an equity or a levered valuation multiple. You never want to be apples to oranges. You don't want to be saying total enterprise value to earnings. You don't want to be saying price to sales or price to EBITDA. All right, operating. Operating to operating, equity to equity. All right, M&A question. If a company with a high P.E. ratio acquires a company with a low P.E. ratio in a stock deal, assuming everything else constant, will it be accretive or dilutive? It's the opposite of what we saw yesterday. It would be an accretive deal. All right, the company buying and issuing stock, their stock is highly valued. It's valuable currency. They have to issue proportionately less of it for every dollar of earnings they acquire. In this case, the numerator earnings is rising faster than the denominator, shares outstanding. All right, that would be an accretive deal. Yesterday was the exact opposite. That Kraft-Kellogg deal was dilutive. You had a low PE buying a high PE in a stock deal. Everyone understand that one? Um, how do you value a company? Basic valuation question. You need to be able to tell people at least these three valuation methodologies, DCF, comps, and precedent transactions. All right, you also should be able to tell someone that trading multiples will give you a minority interest-based valuation. Precedent transactions and DCF will be controlling interest valuations, like we talked about. And everybody should be clear on those as well. Describe each valuation methodology. All right, DCF, we're forecasting future cash flows, discounting them back to the present, using time value of money, using a discount rate. And we'll talk more about the discount rate in a moment. Trading multiples, we're using the stock prices of minority positions and uh, publicly traded comparables. We're using those valuation multiples implied by that analysis to value our company on a minority basis. Precedent transactions, we're looking at actual acquisitions involving controlling interest positions of similar target companies. All right, so again, precedent transactions includes a control premium, so it's on a controlling interest basis. It's the main difference between precedent and trading multiples. Again, same thing. Precedent multiples should be higher because it includes the control premium. In order to induce the selling shareholders to sell, we have to offer them a little bit more. Describe the DCF model in layman's terms, and you will get these definitely if you go into a banking interview. They need to understand they need to know that you understand these things. So you should be able to walk someone through a DCF. I know it includes a lot, lot of steps, but you do need to be able to describe it. So again, a DCF will project future free cash flows out into the future, usually for a five-year period. Those will be discounted using a weighted average cost of capital back to the present. All right. DCF will then calculate the terminal value of the company at the end of the forecast period. In a five-year model, that would be year six and beyond. We would use, calculate that using an EBITDA multiple approach. We would then discount that back to the present as well. 
<clears throat> and we would add the present value of our free cash flows for that five years plus the present value of the terminal value to get the overall value of the company on an enterprise value basis. All right. And DCF, if you're using a weighted average cost of capital approach, will give you total enterprise value as the result. Remember, weighted average cost of capital includes all sources of capital. If you wanted to do an equity value approach, you could, you could then subtract debt get down to subtract debt, add back cash, subtract minority interest, subtract preferred, get down to equity. All right. How do you calculate free cash flow? All right, again, this is an indication of total enterprise value, so we're going to start with EBIT, which is an unlevered operating metric. We'll take out taxes. We'll have to fund our working capital changes. We'll have to fund our CapEx. We'll add back DNA because it's non-cash and that's our free cash flows, that's what gets discounted back, right? How do you calculate terminal value using the Gordon growth approach? It's just a terminal value multiple. If you've ever taken a finance class, this is probably what you've seen. We didn't spend a lot of time on this in class, but terminal value is calculated by growing free cash flows in year five by one plus the growth rate. You would then discount that by cost of equity minus the growth rate. The one thing I would note here, if you're going to use a Gordon growth approach, be real careful what that long-term growth rate is. <clears throat> it should really never exceed inflation. Otherwise, you're implicitly assuming that the company eventually becomes the entire economy. Remember, this goes into infinity. All right, how do you calculate terminal value using the multiple approach? It's just we take our terminal year EBITDA, so year five EBITDA, multiply it by an assumed EBITDA multiple. And a lot of times that assumed EBITDA multiple comes from our comps, comes from other analyses that we've done, showing what that would be at the, you know, what it is today. A lot of times we would assume that that multiple will stay relatively constant and still apply at the end of year five. How do you determine the discount rate to be used in the DCF? Again, it's whack. Weighted average, cost of capital. What is whack? How do you calculate it? All right, whack again, weighted average cost of capital. We are weighting cost of our equity times the relative proportion of equity to the total capitalization. We weight our debt by its weighting in the capital structure. We multiply our cost of debt times one minus the tax rate because interest is tax deductible. Cost of debt should always be looked at on an after-tax basis. How do we calculate cost of equity? Using CAPM, the capital asset pricing model. You will get this one a lot, All right? This is a very, very common question. What is CAPM? How do you calculate it? It's our risk-free rate. Risk-free rate's usually a government security, 20-year T-bond, something like that, 20-year treasury. To that, we add beta times the market risk premium. All right, market risk premium represents the excess return over and above the risk-free rate that we might expect if we hold equities as opposed to U.S. Treasuries. All right, the flaws in the CAPM model, number one, beta, shown not to be an accurate predictor of stock price movements. Um, market risk premium can vary widely depending on what periods you use. Also not necessarily an accurate predictor of future stock price returns. Remember, everything from CAPM is generally looked up. There are ways you can calculate beta, but generally speaking, you're going to look those up, maybe from Bloomberg, maybe from Zacks, maybe from some other financial data source. And typically, you're going to use a five-year beta. Where's the market risk premium come from? Who can tell me? Ibbotson. Ibbotson, exactly. Ibbotson and Associates, or Ibbotson Associates publishes stocks, bond bills quarterly. It's typically looked up from that publication. Typically, we use a long-term equity risk premium. Any questions on that? <clears throat> what is beta in layman's terms? Again, beta measures volatility of a stock relative to an underlying index. It's a measure of quote-unquote systemic risk, systematic risk, risk that we could diversify away if we took a portfolio approach to managing um, investments. So if a company has a beta of two, it means it's going to be twice as volatile as the market. A company with a beta of 1 will be as volatile as the market. A company with a beta of 0.5 would be half as volatile as the market. Right. 
What's more expensive, equity or debt? Equity, right? Because it's the lowest seniority in the capital structure. If a company goes bankrupt, usually the equity of the company is worth nothing. Usually a lot of times some of the debt ends up being heavily discounted in terms of what they're able to recoup. And secondly, there's no obligations for dividends to be paid. Right? Equity is also paid after debt in the income statement. It comes after interest expense. Right. What, which of the following has the lowest rate? Secured debt, secured bank debt, sub debt, preferred equity and equity. It's actually in this order. Secured bank debt will be the lowest. It's secured, it comes first in a liquidation, it gets paid first, it gets paid before equity in our income statement. All right, then sub debt, preferred stock, and then common stock. Cost would get higher as we go down the line for those, those four items. Make sense? Any questions so far? I know I'm going kind of fast. It should be review, right? but if there are questions, please, please ask. What's PIC? Remember, PIC stands for pay in kind, payment in kind. It means that instead of paying interest in cash, the borrower accrues that interest to the prior period's ending balance, and the debt balance continues to get higher. We modeled PIC interest in leveraged buyouts in our leveraged buyout model. Right. Pick debt was typical of LBO structures the last several years, probably until mid-07. It's tough to find any, it's tough to do any deals in private equity right now, but especially tough to find pick debt. All right. Everybody clear on that? Everybody remember the mechanics of modeling that pick interest? Uh, another accounting question. This is another one that people have seen a lot of. I've gotten probably three or four students come back. To, I've had three or four come back to me and tell me that they've seen this exact question out there. All right, so explain how a company purchasing raw material from a vendor is going to work its way through the income statement and balance sheet. When they first purchase it, that inventory balance would increase by the amount of the purchase. Um, and we're assuming that they've bought it on account, so accounts payable would increase by 100 bucks as well. All right, so we're debiting inventory, crediting accounts payable, if we want to talk debits and credits. What happens when the company converts that into a final product for sale? Again, we would be debiting inventory for the amount of that value add, and then possibly accruing a payable or an accrued liability for labor, or maybe even paying that in cash, depending on how that's worked. And the company sells the final product to the customer. We would record a sale of 200 to reflect the sale to the customer. We would credit account, we would credit cost of goods sold, or we, I'm sorry, we would debit cost of goods sold by 150. We would credit inventory by 150 to reduce that balance. We would pay back our payable to our vendor. Okay, we would pay that labor if we hadn't done so already, and retained earnings would increase by $50. Um, that would be the profit on the finished goods, assuming no taxes here. All right, so be prepared to talk through that from an accounting standpoint. Right, let's talk about some interview prep, interview tips. All right, when you're prepping for your interviews, we talked about this before, stay on top of the financial markets, read the journal. And right, if you've got access to Bloomberg, that's a great source. Reuters, Yahoo Finance actually has a lot of good articles on there as well. All right, just make sure you're reading a number of different sources. Um, if you're trying to figure out company or industry specific information, a couple different sites. If you're looking for company specific information, there's a site called vault.com and you can register and I think you can get um, a lot of their content for free. If you want some of, the, um, some of the additional content, you have to pay for it, but I think you get a lot for free. Um, it'll talk about the company, what industry it serves, it'll talk about um, you know, a lot of specifics relative to that company. There'll be message boards where current and former employees might post. Um, take those with a grain of salt. You never know who your source is there, but you can get a sense for, you know, how the company compensates its employees, how it structures bonus pools. Um, you might even find out about some of the goings on within the company that aren't otherwise public. Um, and if you're looking for industry information, wetfeet.com is one site. There are probably many sites that will give industry information. Um, I remember when I was in business school, my career office had 
you know, an industry overview for every single industry. It had compensation surveys for industries as well. Talked about how many students in the prior years had gotten jobs in particular industries, jobs with particular companies. Um, so use your, I would say use your career services, whatever information they make available to you. Rely on that as well. You might also look at wet feet um, for kind of industry guidelines, industry overviews too. Um, common financial technical questions, obviously the ones we just went through are some good ones. The ones in the handouts are good ones. Um, if you review your course materials, I'm sure you could think of dozens of other technical questions that someone might ask. Um, if you want additional information, Vault sells an interview prep book. I think it's like 129 bucks, if I'm not mistaken. Um, whether it's worth it or not is up to you. I think, you know, frankly, the materials we've handed out in class should be pretty comprehensive in that regard. Um, common qualitative questions, you've got a lot of them here. Use your own experience as a guideline as well. There's an unlimited number of qualitative questions you can ask. So, um, This slide, I, I, I won't spend a whole lot of time on. Obviously, when you go into an interview, you're going to want to be confident, composed, well-prepped, well-dressed. All right, banking is a conservative industry. You know, probably a Navy suit, white shirt, basic tie. You know, about all you want to do as far as dress is concerned. Um, and I think composure, confidence, really are going to come from how well you've prepped for your interview. So that's that's up to you. Um, obviously, the the better you can do on those dimensions, the better your interview should go. Um, interviews are also a good time for you to ask questions of the interviewer, especially if you're talking to boutique banks that you may not have a whole lot of information on. This is a great opportunity to figure out what they're all about. What's the culture like? What are the typical um, engagements look like? How many people are on a deal team? All right. How do you get staffed on a particular deal? How many live deals do you have going on right now? Give you a real good sense of whether the bank's really busy or not. Um, Generally speaking, I think if a bank is hiring these days, it probably means they're really busy. Um, what are some other ones? How big are your target clients? I'd be careful with that one. If you're interviewing with a Goldman Sachs, you should know that their target clients are going to be Fortune 500 companies. Right? If you're interviewing with a lower middle market boutique, similarly, you're going to be talking about smaller companies, probably local businesses or regional companies, maybe some mom and pops scattered in there. Right? A boutique, a small lower middle market boutique in Dallas is generally not going to be advising GE on the potential joint venture of NBC and Comcast. All right? So just know, know who you're talking to and be careful about some of these um, questions and how you ask them. What are the main responsibilities of an analyst or an associate? You probably should know. Right? If you're going to Goldman or Morgan Stanley, you will work hard. You will do all the things that we talked about before. You're probably not going to have a life, so don't go asking, you know, what are the hours here? All right, what do people do on weekends? Um, because you probably won't have weekends. All right, so just be careful about how you ask these questions and tailor it to your audience. How would you describe the culture? I think that's really a fair question if you're talking about a boutique bank that you may not have found a lot of information on, on the internet. Or if you just don't know, I think that's a fair question. Again, at a Goldman Sachs, you should know that the culture is an aggressive, hardworking culture all right, that is focused on bringing in as much business and driving as much bonus as possible. Definitely ask questions at your interviews. All right. Worst thing you can say when the interviewer says, do you have any questions? No. All right. Show that you've got some questions. Think some up. All right. Go in with four or five questions. I always like to ask the interviewer, what do you like about the firm? What do you hate about the firm? What would you change about the firm? Those types of things. And try and ask them some open-ended questions that get them talking. It can tell you a lot about that group, that firm, their experience there, what your experience might be like, et cetera. Right. Uh, Follow-up. It's generally good practice to send a thank you note, thank you email. Um, you know, usually, um, like to send this relatively shortly after you've gone through an interview. A um, couple thoughts on this, and these are kind of my own personal thoughts. You know, thank you email is meant to show your interest, meant to show that you, know, you are indeed thankful for someone having taken the time to speak with you. But um, 
I would, I would do a couple things when you're sending thank you notes. First of all, if you've interviewed with several people at the firm, um, I would send out different, different thank you notes. Don't send a form letter where you're just changing the name. Um, they probably wouldn't compare them, but they might. And if they see you're using a form letter, shows that maybe you're not interested enough to customize it. Um, another thing I like to do is keep the thank you notes relatively short. Don't write a 10 paragraph dissertation on why you want to be an analyst at Goldman. Keep it short. The shorter you keep it, the less, op less opportunities you have for making a spelling mistake, saying something stupid, saying something that um, you didn't talk about with that particular interviewer, but you talked about with another one. Right, what I like to do in sending a thank you note is have three basic paragraphs. Paragraph one, thank you for the time, really appreciate it, really enjoyed getting to know you, what have you. Paragraph two, I particularly enjoyed our discussion on the following topic. And pick out something noteworthy from that, that discussion that you had. Maybe you talked about the culture. Maybe you talked about a specific deal that they worked on. I really loved hearing about your you know, XYZ deal. Sounds like a great experience. I personally could contribute in the following ways. Right? And then finally, just a closing paragraph. Again, thank you for your time. Look forward to hearing from you shortly or look forward to hearing from you within a week as we discussed, what have you, sincerely, Jeff Noland, or whatever. All right, keep it short, keep it simple, customize the letters as well. Don't send out form letters. All right, and if you've not heard back from, a while, from them in a while, <coughs> it's not, um, I don't think it's a bad thing to use a, use a phone call. Use these sparingly. I like to only call once if I, if I have to. Um, and actually, I do, the way I send my thank you notes, I usually wait a day or two to send the thank you note, especially if they say we're going to be back to you in a day or two or three days or so. Lob in a thank you note one or two days afterward, kind of jog their memory. Oh, yeah, Jeff is still hanging out there. I still need to respond to him. And then if I still haven't heard within a few days, then I can use a phone call, right? as opposed to sending my thank you note the minute I get home, and then I've still only got one phone call left. So be, you know, be judicious, whatever works for you. You don't want to, um, again, you don't want to send form letters. You don't want to send too long of emails. And you don't want to, obviously, you do not want to be making 10 or 15 phone calls to the firm every day to check up on the status. All right? Use your best judgment there. Um, a couple things to keep in mind, even within the same firm, different groups can have different dynamics. All right? Different groups can be... Uh, more prestigious at particular firms. So <clears throat> you're going to want to think about that in terms of what groups you're going to target. You also want to think about how you might fit into a particular group. If you interview with two different groups at an investment bank, you might have two very different sets of personalities, two very different interview experiences. And you know, I think you're going to want to, by and large, pick the group where at least you feel like you fit a little bit better or is a better fit for you, what have you. It's just something to consider. Um, hours, again, on the bulge bracket firms, you're just going to be, you're signing over your life for two years, pretty much. All right, so don't ask about hours. It's, you're assumed to be there pretty much 18 hours a day. It's 16, 18, some crazy ungodly amount. But within a boutique bank, you might see, you might see um, very different um, perspectives where it comes to hours. The firm I worked for it was generally I don't know, seven to six, seven to seven, generally about a 12-hour day. I could eat dinner at home. Right? I had my weekends for the most part, except when we had a live deal. Um, there were some guys in the bank in my, in my firm that were purely nine to five. They could get their work done, and nobody had a problem with it. Um, some firms might like the, the idea of FaceTime. They just want to see people at their desks for at least a certain period of the day. Um, these are going to be things you're going to figure out. If you're going to ask about hours, again, just be careful how you do it. Don't make it seem as though you don't understand what you're getting into. Don't make it seem like you're not committed to working the necessary amount of hours to be successful. All right, so be just very careful. Um, different groups might have diff different reputations. I think I talked about that. Um, and ideally, you're going to want to find a group within the bank that is working on a lot of deals. Right? You don't want to spend, you want to spend as little of your own time as possible pitching as you can. Um, pitching is interesting to go through once or twice, but once you've gone through a few pitches, frankly, they don't vary all that much. Pitch books don't vary all that much. 
and they're not as marketable on a resume as live deals. So you're going to want a group that's active and doing deals as opposed to a group that's mostly marketing at this point. 